todos, sejam muito bem-vindos à nossa, à nossa palestra com, prof, com o Dr. John Gray e o Dr. Timothy Straub, ambos da USGS. O John Gray é, já está aposentado pela USGS e o Timothy ainda trabalha na USGS, ok? Uh, John Gray ele tem uma empresa no ramo de hidrosedimentologia, a uh, Gray Sedimentology, e tem uma experiência em hidrologia, águas superficiais, transporte de sedimentos, constituintes arrastados, balanço massa e ciclagem de nutrientes em lagos e reservatórios. É, vamos, ele vai dar uma palestra sobre a história da Federal Interagency Sedimentation Project, o projeto da Interagência Federal de Sedimentação, que envolve várias agências nos Estados Unidos, e ele vai explicar isso para nós agora. Okay. Nice to, to meet you again, Dr. John Gray. It's a very pleasure day to have you here on our uh, seminar here. Please, you can now share your presentation and you can start your lecture, please. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, my entire screen. Oh, share. Do you have it? Not yet. It's asking me to share. Share entire screen. Nothing seems to be happening. I'll cancel that. Is it being shared? Yeah, no, no, nothing shared. You can uh, start when you try to share, try to share a, a window and then choose the, the, the PowerPoint and then it's better. Sure, bingo, bingo, okay. Uh, uh, ho hello, everyone. Uh, good morning from uh, wet uh, suburban Washington, D.C. Uh, I hope you can all hear me fine. Um, it, it's wet here. Uh, you might have uh, read in the news that, that hur Hurricane Ian that hit of uh, uh, Florida, United States last uh, Thursday. Uh, the remnants are up here. I've, I've received 5,182 millimeters, millimeter inches, uh, millimeters of uh, rain, uh, which is two inches here, not much. Anyway, uh, uh, Fabio and uh, Diogo, thanks. Many thanks for the opportunity to uh, give this presentation. I wish I could be there. Uh, the, the last uh, uh, ENES that I attended uh, about 10 years ago in Mato Grosso and, and about five years ago in Vittorio, uh, thoroughly enjoyed my times with my uh, Brazilian colleagues and, And uh, they brought me down to give, but I took as much as I could. I learned a lot. These are great conferences, and I, I hope this isn't the last one that I participate in. And I hope the next that I participate in will be in, uh, in person. Um, uh, uh, I also want to thank my uh, USGS colleague, Tim Straub, who's also the Federal Interagency Sedimentation Project Chief. Um, uh, we'll be tag teaming today. I'll, I'll give the, the, uh, the history and, and Tim will give the, the here and now of uh, new technologies and, and uh, sediment instrumentation and, and data collection. Uh, I'll take no more than 20 minutes. Ha ha. Everybody that knows me knows that I talk on and on like I'm doing now. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll be talking about the history of the Federal Interagency Sedimentation Project, which ironically Tim's the, the chief of, but, 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 but I'm, I'm the institutional memory. Uh, the presentation I'm giving you is based on a paper um that was uh uh that i gave in 2015 at the 
uh, federal interagency sedimentation conference that was held in Reno, Nevada, USA. Um, so uh, moving on, uh, the history of the federal interagency sedimentation project. Uh, the, the FISP, which I'll refer to uh, hereafter, was formed in, in 1939. And you will see why, as I move through the presentation, um, why, why it was formed and, and how incredibly successful it has been uh, to the benefit of uh, uh, not only in the United States, but in Brazil, South America, Argentina, um, and in, in Europe. Uh, and in uh, New Zealand, et cetera. Uh, as, as Tim might describe a little bit, the, the FISP started in 1939, but a lot has changed uh, they, uh, as the times have gone on and they've learned more and there's been new challenges and new needs and particularly new capabilities um, uh, electronic and, and, and computerization, if you will, uh, that, that has, has given us uh, 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 great opportunities to expand our ability to collect uh, reliable and uh, quanti quantifiably accurate uh, suspended data. Uh, so, uh, Tim will talk a little bit more about this. My, my presentation will be the background. I've already given the origin and the mission. And then I'm going to talk about the six general phases from 1939 to 2022 um, of, the, uh, uh, of the FISP. I'll give one through five history, and Tim will, will give phase six, which is new technologies. OK, going way back. Uh, we, we have records at least back 200 years uh, on uh, sediment data collection in Europe. Uh, but, but the evidence says that China was doing this long before anybody else was, but I haven't been able to find any other early, uh, earlier uh, 1700s or before information on that. But uh, the United States started to become interested in uh, uh, sediment transport and rivers, at least by 1838 on the Mississippi River. And, and then a lot of interest in the Mississippi River and the Missouri River Basin in the central uh, United States, uh, Colorado River Basin and there uh, about 100 years ago, uh, and the Missouri River Basin leading up to the construction of many dams on the Missouri River in the 1950s. Uh, and then since 1930, a proliferation of, of sediment monitoring in the United States. Now, important uh, uh, with respect to the Federal Interagency Sedimentation Project and, and to the uh, type of instruments that have developed, it was noted in, uh, in the middle 1940s and, and thereafter um, in three watersheds of the Colorado River Basin, the Green River, the San Juan River, and the Colorado River, uh, that, that the, a double mass curve, and that is on the, uh, uh, on the X axis is cumulative water discharge and this is in English units, but I, but I don't think that, 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 uh, that that's a, a deal killer here, particularly relevant. And this is cumulative annual suspended sediment loads. And when there's no changes in a watershed and land use or other factors, that double mass curve more or less is a straight line. And it was from from uh, uh, when they started a monitor in the 1930s, whoops, back up to the mid 1940s. And then suddenly there was a break to the right. In other words, uh, less 
sediment per, per liter of water than before. And then in uh, around 1965 or so, another break, even less uh, sediment per, per liter of water. And the question is why? Well, I can explain this one was easy to explain. They put a, a dam upstream and the sediment quit coming down the river. And so for the same volume of water, there would be much less sediment being released by the dam. But this one was a, was a, uh, a mystery. And there were all sorts of theories on what would have caused this. Were there land use changes such as grazing uh, vegetation? Did climate start changing around then? Uh, they, they wondered intrinsic, were there changes in intrinsic tributary geomorphic processes, whatever that is, or maybe none of the above. It just so happened that the, the sampler on the left, the Colorado uh, River sampler used in the Colorado River Basin was just basically a weighted bottle sampler with a cork, with a plug that would be lowered to the bed of the stream, a messenger weight, a lead weight sent down, opening the, uh, opening the plug and then pulled up quickly to fill as, as it was being dragged up. And that was used from, uh, uh, from the early, before the middle 1940s. And then, in the, and then around 1942 or 1943, the first FISP isokinetic samplers, I believe Tim will, will might, uh, might mention what isokinetic, but I'll just give it in, in, general, in, in, in general. An isokinetic suspended sediment sampler samplers, samples the river water at the same rate that, the, that it's coming down the channel at the sampler, which was, which turned out to be very critical um, to uh, particularly when there's sand in transport down the river. Now, an interesting aside that um, that Tim that, that Dr. Straub might not even know about 20 years ago, two of my colleagues, two two of our colleagues, um, Randy Parker and uh, David Topping. Uh, knew that there was some problem associated with this 1945 shift. They went to a gauging station on the Colorado River at the bottom of Grand Canyon to do some testing. They opened up the subfloor on that gauging station, and there was the original Colorado River sampler sitting there. They were able to use the exact same sampler that produced many of these uh, many of the concentration values from uh, before uh, the middle 1940s. The problem was when you would lower this to the bottom of a sand bed stream and pull the cork, the, there would be an inrush of water from hydrostatic pressure from a part of the stream that was relatively highly concentrated in sand. Boom, just like that. And then as it was pulled up, it would dilute a little bit. That, that, that they found that, that the concentrations in the Colorado sampler were as much as three times what was actually coming down the channel. So, so there was one of the big reasons um, that, that the FISP uh, was formed to, to figure out what, what was the problem and how to correct it. Here's some early pre-1939 uh, sediment samplers. Uh, 1933 silt sampler, this Tate Binkley sampler, which is just a uh, uh, open tube, closed tube. Um, and then uh, a couple from South America, Argentina. Uh, this, this sampler and this nozzle is, is more or less the same as these. Um, I'm, um, I, 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 I can't say for certain, but I'm skeptical that how isokinetic these would be when the FISP has put so much effort into trying to, to match what comes in here and the rate that the air goes out of here. It's not a simple 
issue of just putting in a copper tube and bending another one. Uh, Russia, weighted bottle samplers here, and the Delft uh, in the Netherlands, the Delft Nile sampler, which is actually a pretty good sampler. Here's the suspended sediment part of it, and here's the bed load part of it. Uh, uh, re relatively sophisticated, certainly compared to these to these other ones. Uh, and another type was the Joukowsky suspended sediment sampler. I think it was developed in Austria or something like that, and uh, adapted by China. Here I am on the Yellow River 20 years ago, May, and. Next, you're going to see, so we're, we're on a boat anchored on the Yellow River and about to deploy a Joukowsky sampler on, the, on this long pole. Okay, that worked. Oh, please. That worked just fine. Uh, I'm going to go back once and then I'm going to go forward again. I really do want you to see this, this uh, video. And I think what I might do uh, I'll try to find it. Sorry about this. Let's see, try this one more time. Hmm. If I can't get this going in about one minute, I'm going to, I'm going to give up. Back, back with you here. Sorry, I'm so inefficient. And now it's working fine, of course, but you've already seen this. I'll let you look at it one more time. This is my friend, uh, Zhang Luzu on the left and his colleague. And then one more time, the Joukowsky sampler. Open, basically an open bottle, pull, pulled the cord to close it, bring it up and dump a liter. And there's Zhang emptying it. Okay, uh, the, uh, the six phases, uh, I will go through the first five. Manual samplers for collection of, of physical sediment samples starting in 1939. Here's the first report they came out in August of 1940. They went this report number one in 1940 goes over. And by the way, these are all online. Uh, and you can get this information from the Federal Interagency Sedimentation Project website, I believe. Um, uh, gives us a summary of the existing equipment from the 1939 and before. Uh, so in 1940, uh, again, uh, equipment for bed load and bed material sampling. 1941 for suspended sediment samplers. And then uh, 11 years later, the design and improved of improved suspended sediment samplers. And here's what, what uh, this, this uh, 
uh, uh, graphic is, is probably 15 years old or so. There are additional samplers, I am certain. Tim can, Tim can mention on that. But these samplers are used even in, in every continent, even in Antarctica, where, where a colleague of ours went with a DH-48, this sampler, to sample glacier uh, melt in An Antarctica uh, about 20 years ago or so. Uh, uh, DH-48 developed in 1948, isokinetic. The point integrating P61, uh, clean trace element samplers, the BL84 bed load sampler that, that I've worked to calibrate, bottom material sampler, and a uh, gravelometer to uh, manually determine bed material uh, particle sizes. Uh, then the next phase was uh, development of sediment analytical instruments. They were largely uh, wonderful ideas, but the technology just wasn't up to it for the most part. Early Coulter counter that now uh, uh, co commercially available and very uh, uh, interesting, useful, and expensive devices, uh, turbinimeters, uh, and then the visual accumulation tube, which is still used today by the USGS to determine uh, the uh, 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 amount of sand and the gradations of sand in a sediment sample. Uh, Next came automatic samplers, uh, mostly in the 1950s and 1960s. This, this passive sampler I've modified uh, uh, because we had a recirculation problem. It would fill airlock, but then when the velocity head was too uh, differential here, it would keep filling and filling with sediment. And so if anybody's interested in this, let me know and I can give you my updated version. I don't remember what what this monstrosity is called. But when I came in to the USGS in 1977, this is what I was using, the, P6, the PS69 pumping sampler. And what a monster it was, but it was a huge leap in our ability to automatically pump samples from a river. Uh, uh, I'm not going to get into uh, automatic sediment gauges. Uh, but I will just briefly describe uh, the need back in the 1970s and 1980s to be able to collect suspended sediment, uh, uh, suspended water samples uh, for the analysis of trace elements, uh, metals and metal, uh, metalloids uh, in the river, mercury, et cetera, uh, that we found out the hard way that our uh, metallic instruments were, were automatically uh, contaminating. And so here's the, 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 the D95 developed in, in 1995, D96 in 1996. And this one, uh, uh, I think it's, a, a, Tim can comment, that that's the 99, and there's at least one or two more of these clean samplers. So, um, Without, without further ado, uh, here I am, folks, in, in, in 2002, and um, I'm going to cede my uh, screen to Tim. I will stay on to the end of Tim's presentation, and if anybody has any questions, I'll, I and I'm sure Tim will be glad to answer. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you, John. Nice presentation. And sorry, <clears throat> nice presentation. And now we are waiting. Uh, Tim, you can share your presentation. And then in the end, you're going to make a, a discussion or questions, OK? So don't worry about that. In the end, we'll do that. You can do your presentation, Tim. No problem. All right. 
So everybody can see the presentation? Yes. All right, great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, this is my first ENA ES um, conference, so I'm um, excited to be here and the opportunity to present. And as John and Fabio mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the the fifth, the new technologies for monitoring sediment transport. And um, but it's it's you know presenting work that a lot of different folks have done. Um, so I'm going to be um, showing names and reports and things. Uh, throughout to give them credit. So here's my outline. Before I get started on the new technologies, I just want to give an update on our bag sampler intake efficiencies. As John mentioned, the, the importance of isokinetic and, and things, and we have a new report out this year that I thought might be of interest to people. And then I'll jump into the new technology. There's a new sampler development, and then into the surrogates, uh, which I think most of you would be interested in uh, the suspended sediment ones in particular, and then a, a few things on, on bed load surrogates. So the best sampler intake efficiencies. Uh, so maybe 10 or so years ago, there were some questions about the intake efficiencies of the bag samplers. And um, they basically what, maybe stepping back a little bit from that, intake efficiency is you know, we want that mean intake velocity into the, the sample to be the same as the mean stream velocity. And when that is when that is happening, then we call that an isokinetic sampler. And uh, all the results I'll talk about today on this topic are in the new report that came out in 2022. Uh, the author at a master. So isokinetic, just real briefly. Um, so when we we have isokinetic situation where the velocity in the nozzle is the same as the ambient velocity, then we have the sediment is also the same in the nozzle as it is in the ambient. If the uh, nozzle velocity is too slow, then we have a uh, much concentration going into the tamper, and if it's too fast into the nozzle, then we don't have uh, enough concentration going into the sampler. Uh, so it's it's a fairly big deal. The uh, this gives a little bit more information on how big a deal that is, depending on what type of uh, material that you're sampling. Because on the x-axis here, we have the intake efficiency, um, again the mean intake velocity to the mean stream velocity. So at one, we um, have zero air and concentration. So on the y-axis now we have the air and concentration. And so you can see as we deviate from one, you can get, in particular in the sands, you can get a decent amount of air. And then in the silt and clays, um, not, not as much um, as you might expect. So we compiled, um, just to check our bag samplers, we compiled over a number of years, 369 samples at 31 sites to check and see how they were performing out in the field. Um, and so this is a myriad of, of samplers, the D96, which John showed the D99, and then another one, the DH2 bag sampler. Um, and it's four, uh, here you see three plots, it's for three different um, nozzle sizes, the 3 16th inch, the quarter inch, and 5 16th inch. So we, as you can see here, we mostly use the 3 16th inch nozzle for a lot of conditions, um, and then a little bit less on the other two nozzle sizes. And then this, um, but as you can see, um, and this is plotted now on the Y, or on the X axis, it's stream velocity. So um, and the next um, plot I'll show is on the x-axis will be water temperature, which are, these are two of the bigger factors um, that might affect intake efficiency. And so we were um, fairly happy with these results. That I think the mean was in the, um, you know, near one or a little bit less than one on, on these data. Um, so, you know, showing that our samplers are, are our isokinetic out in the field for bag samplers in particular. 
And this is just another way of plotting the data. So it, again, it's intake efficiency on the y-axis and now water temperature um, to see the effects of, of possible effects of water temperature. Again, saying this is that same data set, 369 samples at 31 sites. All right, so now jumping into the new technologies, uh, we have um, started developing um, a sampler, a point, another point sampler. Our, our old point sampler had issues um, and things, so we we wanted to address some of those issues and, and maybe start using some of the more modern technologies of developing samplers and building samplers. We're partnering with uh, CarNet Technologies, the FISTAs, and uh, to develop this next generation of a point sampler. And, you know, when we started looking at this, we wanted to address the, the issues with our current point sampler. Um, and so we made a list and kind of ranked the priorities of what we wanted to address with these. And, you know, we for sure want it to be drawing so we could continue the, the development and building of these in the future. There were some problems with the old um, solenoids uh, in, in the, uh, the old sampler. And then we started talking about um, could this new sampler be both depth integrating and a point sampler? And, you know, whether that's um, one head on the sampler or it, it's a head that could swap out for point or depth integrated sampling. And uh, I'll give a little update on that. I won't do my, my uh, punchline on that one as we go through some of these photos of it. Um, and then we're talking about the bottle content, you know, whether it's going to be a, a bottle or a bag. Um, and ends up we're, we're doing the, so the bag sampler, another bag sampler, um, even though they're examples. Um, and then, yeah, some energy, you know, just a lot of different things that we're looking at. One down here at the bottom on the buoyant head. So if, you know, the, the, head, the sampler falls off in the river, um, can we make it buoyant so that we don't lose it, which is one of the more intricate parts of the sampler. So this is the design of the sampler it looks a lot like the the old samplers it's actually very similar to the p6200 sampler which is one of our newest uh, point samplers the difference here is that um, there's 3d printing technology being used to to produce the shell at least of the the sampler and then that sampler that shell is then being filled with weights and epoxy so trying some new things with the, the building of the sampler to these mill stations and, and factories and things are getting harder and harder to get um, some of these samplers made. So trying something new with this. And then also, as uh, many people have tried, you know, to, to strap surrogate technologies to the samplers or weights and things, we're trying to think ahead with that with, um, Having some attachments for the sampler to, to be able to to um, have surrogates attached to it um, that would go down to the sampler. And so we're in the final stages of development. This is, you know, I haven't shown a, a picture of it completely together yet because I don't think there is one. Um, hopefully, in the next few weeks there will be there will be one. But this is the head of what the head of the sampler looks like. Um, similar to the other ones, it it is going to be interchangeable, or, or it, it, yeah, the interchangeable. It'll be both a point sampler or a depth integrated sampler, all in one head of the sampler. So uh, that that'll be a nice uh, feature. And uh, so continue to as we do some performance tests, just reach out to me to see if you're interested in this particular sampler. So now I'll go ahead and start talking about the suspended sediment surrogates. Um, and before I jump into that, I just want to, you know, give um, uh, you know, why surrogates 
type of slide. Um, and, and really, it's as we do some of these surrogates, we're seeing how dynamic um, some of the, the parameters are. And so as, as you can see here, the, uh, on the, the, the x-axis, we have time. And then on the y-axis, we have a few different parameters. Um, this red line is gauge height. So the state, the, the water level of the stream. And then the, uh, the blue line that most of you would be interested in is, is turbidity. Um, and then the green line is, is nitrate. Is this particular station with a continuous nitrate probe. Um, but this is one of our, one of a larger stream versus maybe a smaller stream. And you see here the timeline, uh, it's the same though. And these, the smaller stream and larger stream peaked, the, the turbidity or the sediment peaked within 24 hours of each other. Um, so if you think about, you know, a normal sampling scheme, um, you know, these red dots might indicate when we might have been able to get there to sample. These are actually uh, discharge measurements, which a lot of times we will do discharge and, and set, um, sediment sampling at the same time. Um, but the, and, and they did a, a really good, nice job of getting the peak of the stream, of the, the gauge height or the stream flow. But, you know, that would have completely missed some of these peaks of the other parameters. Or um, even if you look at nitrate, you know, there's another peak over here for, for nitrate. So anyway, it's, it's giving us more detailed information of, of um, what, what might be going on on the streams and, and decreasing the uncertainty in, in load computations and things like that. Uh, although, however, you can see with the picture on the left here, I mean, there is quite a bit of instrumentation and infrastructure that goes into one of these. Um, so there's, there's a balance there of um, cost benefit. So the, the first surrogate that I'll talk about is um, the ADVM, acoustic dock for velocity meter, then the uh, ADF, and then, which is kind of, uh, this, so this is kind of your traditional, what you would use in an index velocity site um, for, for velocity. So we're trying to double dip and get some information about sediment from these instruments. This is uh, an instrument more like a turbidity instrument. It's smaller. Just single purpose used. It's not used for um, um, velocity at all. It's just used for sediment. And then the, I'll also talk about the downlooking ADCPs after after I talk about these. So with the ADVM, there is a uh, techniques and method document that we have out for single frequency. Um, a publication in I think 2016. There's also an online course that you can take in this. That that online course is a prerequisite then for our in-person course, which is also noted on the website there. Um, but yeah, the online course is is open anytime of the year to anyone. And then the on the in-person course, we I don't think we've decided yet if we're going to have one in in 2023. Or not, but that will be updated on the website when we do decide make that decision. So again, we're trying to make use of the the instruments that are already out in the field, maybe doing index velocity already. Um, and the goal in this case, instead of indexing to um, velocity, we're trying to index to sediment concentration. So you have your continuous instrument out there, and then every so often it's for various conditions, you go and take some sediment samples and relate these acoustic parameters mm -hmm. to the sediment concentration you get from the, the sampler. And this is what an example um, plot might look like at the end of the, the project or at the end of a few years. Um, so here you have on the, the x-axis, the mean sediment corrective backscatter. And that's also just it's an acoustic parameter that talks a little bit more about um, that's can we can compute it from the ADVM. And then, then the y-axis, 
you have to suspend the sediment concentration from your, your samples. And so from that, you develop those relations and then you can come up with a continuous. So here on the, on the x-axis, we have time. And here <clears throat> on the y-axis, we have set, suspended sediment concentration and uh, the predicted SSC, which is this uh, brown line from the acoustic, you know, the continuous acoustic instrument, and then you know, the samples extend here, um, and then some uncertainty about the prediction, and there's also the gray areas. And this is for a um, publication um, on the Elwha River where there was a large scale dam removal. So, as you can imagine, with with this um, method, there's quite a bit of um, computation that goes on. So we, uh, you know, originally we we're just trying to use spreadsheets, but then came up with a, a software package that's available online that uh, will help compute the the uh, acoustic parameters. Uh, I should note with this, you know. Method on that like index block, you do need um, the data from multiple cells. So this is the like the instrument was here. This is looking away from the instrument or um, distance away from the instrument. So uh, this is just kind of a schematic of some of the computations that go on, and then more detail on the techniques and method, and then also in this user manual. But uh, um, that's just one thing to note whenever, if you're going to go out and set one of these acoustic instruments up, um, and it's already being used for index velocity. We made this mistake early on um, in the process. Uh, you actually need to collect a little more data than what the uh, index velocity folks are, are using. You need to have um, individual cell data for the back there. So the, the software essentially it, it assists in the creation of regression models, the relate response and explanatory. There, so it, this software actually could be used for more than just the sediment acoustics. Could could be used for turbidity or other things. Um, and then, but then the real emphasis or power or the reason for um, setting up or developing the software is something to uh, process the acoustic parameters. To be used as explanatory variables for the spin sediment concentration. So it supports this is the 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 technique methods I had at the to start of this part of the presentation. Um, and then this is the turbidity um, techniques and method. Um, and then it uh, it also supports some of our other internal USG type policy modes. So our current work with this, uh, we're working on a software version to incorporate the dual frequency methodology. So what I, everything I've been talking about so far is for single frequency, but um, Topping and others in the Grand Canyon group have um, worked on uh, a dual frequency method so that you can get more at particle size. And if you have some more, there's some limit, there's definitely limitations to single frequency and hot, um, in the conditions that it works and that's all documented in that techniques and method the dual frequency takes you to another level if you have a more dynamic system and, and things with um, changing particle sizes and, and all that so uh, we're working on that right now there's it's just a myriad of software um, and spreadsheets and things to do that method but we're working on something that would be publicly releasable uh, Assist is contracted with uh, Dick Topping and, and some Ron Griffiths and others in his group. And then um, a couple other things that current work for this. So whether you're using single frequency or dual frequency, um, these acoustic instruments were were not necessarily set. The, the, the parameters that were used from them, the backscatter, were not necessarily um, 
developed to use in this application. So we swap one instrument for another one. Say you have an instrument out there, you have developed things and um, it breaks. And then you have to put a new instrument in. May, even if it's the same model, you may have a little shift in your in your readings. So we're working with um, a Hood at One Fish Engineering to come up with a what we call beam normalization method, so that um, you can have your instrument put into this testing environment, and then. If it breaks and you have another instrument put in that same testing environment, that you can swap them and have an adjustment um, if there's some differences in them, so that your your instruments are basically the, the same. Eventually, we'd like you know the the manufacturers to kind of work with the manufacturers so that we can swap instruments, um, but we're not quite there yet with them. Um, although there is um, one manufacturer that is, has been working on some more accurate measure of backscatter and also put in three frequencies to the instrument. So Rowan, um, uh, Rowan Industry, they, they've developed one, a prototype, and we've, we've used this. Um, it's installed in the Colorado River, and they're doing some testing on it um, this year and, and probably next year and, uh, as we continue to work on that instrument. So now moving on from, so what I've been talking about um, so far is ABM. Now moving on to the ABS, the backscatter sensor. So this is more like a, a point, um, what I call a point acoustic instrument. Um, it's single use, it's for um, just for use for sediment. You can't use it for velocity or anything. Developed by Sequoia Scientific. A photo here. Um, our, um, hydrologic instrumentation facility did some back testing of this instrument early on. There's a report um, here on this page. This uh, the operating frequency of this is the eight megahertz, so quite a bit um, higher than than some of the other instruments that we use for velocity. Again, so it's only short um, signal going out a short distance from the from the instrument. And then um, more recently, we did some uh, compiled some field testing. Uh, so in 2020, our 2020, we came out with a report, of nine different sites. I think uh, close to um, close to 400 samples at a variety of sites across the U.S. And this is the results for one site, um, acoustic backscatter sensor is now on the x-axis to send it set concentration on the y-axis this is giving you um, this instrument gives you one reading and uh, what we're calling a acoustic backscatter sensor sediment um, and then you know it's not really a fair um, fair thing to do to plot all the data from all the sites in one one um, plot because of the differences in sediment characteristics and things like that but we decided to go ahead and, and do that for this report just to see how things were lining up and uh it lined up really well um overall even considering all the different types of sediment that would be in all these different rivers so i know the manufacturer was uh, you know interested and excited about this plot the uh um, and but you can see, you know, different. Here's that Missouri River um, site, and then here's another Missouri River site, and then here's the the Colorado River. So those, you know, more maybe more sandy streams are lining up, and then um, some of the other ones like this Rock Creek is maybe uh, sandy. So there's some differences definitely, but it, within each site, you know, they. Um, there's definitely some correlation there you see. And you know, with that data, that same data collection, we took advantage of the instrument being kind of a point sampler. Um, so we put the ABS um, sensor, turbidity sensor, and also took point specific sediment samples. 
in some of these sites, like four of them, so most of them are um, continuous sites, um, but at a field, we did these cross sections where we looked at, you see a lot of data in just uh, today's time and, and variable, variable data. Um, so we, we took samples at all these points, the black dots here, across the cross section, multiple verticals. This is a, a setup like the, the Bureau of Reclamation had for it. Um, I won't say who set up this for it. Uh, the, uh, here's the ABS, here's the turbidity sensor. Um, this is also why with the new sampler, the P21, we're trying to make it easier to, to put surrogate technology um, on the instrument a little safer. Uh, but anyway, the data from them, from the state set is, is very interesting. So I'm still one site here, the Missouri River at Nebraska City. Um, here we have uh, acoustic backscatter sensor sediment and turbidity on the on the x-axis. And then here we have on the y-axis depth below the surface in meters. So for example, this is the at zero depth. So this is the, the water level right here, the top of water. And then we're going down um, into the water column here. And so these dashed lines show the turbidity um, readings. And as you can see here, as we go down, um, there's not a lot of variability in turbidity. Um, and if we think about this, the solid lines of the ABS readings, so these two solid lines here, there's also not a lot of variability as we go down. And those are stations five and one. So if we go back to this slide, uh, so station five, or I'm sorry, five and one here are on the side. Um, and then the two, three, and four are in the center of the channel. So actually, um, we, uh, so what's going on here? Because on, on these other stations, two, three, and four, we're seeing a lot of variability as we go down in the water column, a lot of change in concentration. And so what, Captain here, this ABS is doing a really nice job of picking up sands that are transported along. This is a fairly sandy river, especially on the toward the bottom. And the ABS is doing a great job of picking up those the the sands. Um, but there's not much sand moving on the on the the verticals one and five, so it's not picking up here. And turbidity um, just simply doesn't see the sands as well as the the abs is seeing it then we know that from previous studies and, and things um and that's why um looking at it, well i'll talk about some of this future mixing the abs and turbidity and what sequoia has done with that before i get into that i just want to drill down into this data set just a little bit more so this is again missouri river at nebraska city this is the the points that you just saw, the total suspended sediment is what we were just looking at um, on the other plots. But here you can see in that cross section, um, this is a, there's in the concentration, there's not much change in fines, which we wouldn't expect. It's fairly well mixed in the, the cross section. Um, oops, I'll go back. Um, but there's the change in the, the, the sands, the, the, the purple here. Um, and that's what's being picked up by the ABS um, correlates well. And then if we go to the, now we're looking at turbidity instead of the ABS readings. The so turbidity on the X axis, we can see here um, for a change in, we'll just focus on the, the purple here, the change in sand. So as, say at this reading here of turbidity, we can see quite a bit of concentration change in sand and here again. And so just showing um, how the turbidity is having, having more difficult time um, correlating with the, uh, and, and well, actually just seeing the, the change in concentration in sand. Uh, here's another example. This is the Elwha River. So this is not one of the cross section sites. This is one where it's just left continuously out in the, in the stream um, and then samples gotten 
every so often and and a lot more fines in this case uh, the sand is not changing very much and this this is the, on the x-axis is the acoustic back together the abs readings um but it's still um correlating fairly well with the fines um however so this is the abs if we go to turbidity um for fines there's a a tighter fit um the tribute is doing a better job here of seeing the fines and and with the you know some of the things um that sequoia has out on their website we would expect that um about the abs it it, it has an optimal range of what uh it it will see and that's why they're they've been working on um what they call an aobs which is basically just the abs and then a, combining it with some turbidity instrument and it could be the one that they sell or any of turbidity instruments but if you combine those data streams that um you can get some some really good results because you get you know the turbidity really covering the fines and then the, the abs picking up the sands and it, it it does really well so um however what one thing current work on this, uh, the ABS, we we found at some sites when you leave these out that they will they will drift over time. So it's, um, when I say drift, um, so for the uh, a reading that might read 100 at the beginning of the installation, maybe it's reading 120 um, at the end of the installation um, time or the time period that you might be monitoring. So in the USGS, we, you know, that can happen with turbidity, that can happen with, you know, various instruments, but we like to be able to know how much that's shifted so then we can adjust the record because that we want to see a consistent record. So we're, we're currently um, developing some methods to check the calibration drift in the field or in the lab. Because right now to do a, cal a full calibration uh, on this instrument, you have to send it back to the manufacturer to do that. But we just need to have something a little simpler for us to know, you know, from, um, you know, every six weeks or eight weeks or whatever to check this instrument. We, we don't want to go one year and not realize the instrument's drifted a whole bunch that we, we don't know when it happened or how much it happened in different time periods. Um, so we need something that to check this instrument more regularly compared to what we might do with the turbidity sensor. So we should be coming up with a, a report um, later this year or early um, in 2023 with that. All right, so now moving on to, uh, so we're on the acoustic um, world, but now we're looking at the uh, down-looking um, Profiler, acoustic Doppler current profiler. Many of you have probably seen these instruments um, used for um, discharge measurements, getting velocity readings. Um, very useful instruments. Um, but what we'd like to do instead of this being a velocity here, um, we are trying to see if we can do make this um, sediment concentration and. There's uh, on the website here, there's some information that I'll, I'll be going through some of that, but there you can dig into it a little deeper on the website. Um, yeah, I think I'll go ahead to the next slide. So yeah, so taking then the backscatter is what another parameter that this instrument will give you, but this doesn't quite, there needs to be some adjustments made to it, but this doesn't look right. That, you know, sands or whatever would be higher concentrations would be at the top. So we're making these adjustments and with samples and things, we can end up with suspended sediment concentration in the uh, in our axis or in, in our um, labeling here. And so, how how are we doing this? And as it says here, these procedures are in research. So Still in development. It's, it's actually quite labor intensive to get the samples to be able to calibrate this at this point in time. 
And that's what we're working on to see if, how many samples we really need. Um, and uh, just different shortcuts that we might be able to take in the future and how applicable, if we, we rate this for one condition in the stream, you know, can we use that same rating for other conditions? Um, so quite a bit of research still going on with this. Um, but essentially what you need, and this is on the, the website, you know, you need um, stationary ADCP um, reading and sediment point samples. So in the in the vertical in the point samples so that we can correlate to the uh, the ADCP readings, acoustic readings. Um, and then you also it's useful to have a ADC cross section before and after and then also in uh, a cross section of sediment um, sampling. Um, which are these are just kind of bonus things that we like to in there so that we can say, uh, if I go back to this, if we come up with a concentration for the average concentration for the cross section, we want to be able to say, um, you yeah, know, that's the same as our cross section sediment sample, or maybe not. So, again, yeah, we're trying to take the um, use these instruments beyond just velocity, trying to take the backscatter data and turn it into um, suspended sediment. All right, so now moving on to laser diffraction devices. You know, there are, um, as John pointed out, the you know, uh, early days of the, the lab in terms of the bench top laser diffraction. And I'm not gonna go into is any of the benchtop um, information, the FISC hasn't done a, uh, a lot of work in this area, although I will say that we are um, funding some work and just um, the, um, like the sample handling of these, the sample before you put it into a laser fraction benchtop, and so that can have a big difference on, on your results. Um, the the technology itself, I think there's probably still needs to be some standardization and things. If you whether you use this brand of instrument versus another brand, um, I think there's there's still research and things to be done done with that. But I'll talk today a little bit more about the an in situ example, the the list SL, and now that there's at least SL2 is out. Um, I'll, I'll present some of the results of the SL work that has been done, um, and then coming out probably, I think it's in review, journal reviews, some of the results for the SL2, and I'll give you a contact person to, to contact for that. So the first publication uh, on the list SL came out in 2014, put the um, link here in the, the presentation. And the results of this were, were promising that here on the x-axis we have the volumetric suspended sediment concentration. So this is what the reading that the the list SL is giving you. And here we have mass suspended sediment concentration. So this is what your sample, what we're getting from the sample. So as you can see here, the um, fairly good fit over, again, this is a, a lot of different sites that were looked at um, and correlate. Also, it, it definitely seems to be a good surrogate for sediment, the mass of sediment concentration. The, if, we were, if we assume the, the density of the sediment is 2.67, then it's it's not, some of these sites are getting fairly close to that, uh, maybe some of the more sandy sites, um, but then the ones that have fines, you know, whether it's um, uh, flocculation or um, some of the shapes of those particles or whatever that are throwing this off to um, a reading of a, a less, less dense reading. Um, 
But overall, I'd say that's very promising. Again, there'll be the list SL2 results will be coming out um, in the next, um, hopefully, months in a, in a journal. Here's some more of the list SL readings for particle size. So here on the X axis, we have particle size, our particle diameter, and then for finer. So for, say, a sandy string, we have the black line as the the list SL reading, the volumetric, um, oh, I'm sorry, the mass, that, that, the black line is mass from the lab. Um, and then the pink line here is from the, the list SL too. So on sandy sites, they match really well. And as you get less sandy, they deviate. Um, part of that is that at least with the list SL, there, there was a certain range of, of um, the particle sizes that the list SL could not see. So um, when you take into account adjusting that, that's you know the difference between the pink line. So that's raw data from those SL, and you you adjust it for the particle sizes that it didn't see. Then it, it lines up fairly well with the, the lab um, particle sizes. So. Um, fairly promising there, and that the Lilith SL2 has a more wider range of particle sizes that it sees. That was one of the improvements of the list SL2 that came out, um, and, and all the actual instruments of the, uh, the yeah, laser diffraction instruments in that era. So, as I mentioned, there's some list SL2 going on in the fifth this morning. Uh, John, Shuba, I put his email address in there if you want to get some some updates from him or he might have some early releases of, of that those results. All right, so now moving on to um, pressure difference. So this might you may or may not get into a situation um, like some of our colleagues in New Mexico had. Uh, Jeb Brown. The New Mexico Water Science Center, with his name here. So these are some of the conditions. So very, very, very high concentration um, situations. Um, so the the question was, you know, could you use a density difference method? So measuring the density in the water. Um, so basically, it's similar to a bubbler stream gauge, and but instead of one bubbler, you have two bubblers yeah, that are measuring pressure, and and you can get then that that pressure difference between the two. You can um, get an estimate or something, a parameter that you can can then correlate with the systemic sediment concentration. And there's actually some, I think, uh, Sutron makes a double bubbler system that you can buy off the shelf now. Um, And uh, these are some of the results that Jeb had. Um, the and as you can see, some of the concentrations that he's working with. You know, this is 180,000 milligrams per liter. So yeah, you might see some scatter in this this spot, but is there any other instrument that could correlate this uh, with these type of concentrations? So if you have a a situation like um, like the ones here in in Mexico that they're having. This this might be an option for you. And then lastly, is what I'll talk about for sediment sedimentary grits are the cameras camera work. So a lot of work um, that Adam Mossbrooker in uh, Put his name here. Um, in the USGS has been working on basically, you know, just uh, it's trying to just a normal SLR camera. Um, just trying to keep it to something that it would be you could buy off the shelf. I uh, and using some of the spectral information from it, correlating that with the the concentration of 
and he has um I didn't put that in there, but if you if you contact me, I can get you in touch with some of his his papers on this. Sorry about that. The uh, he has some um, information, and we're trying that in more in new ways. And I know in Brazil, there's quite a bit of work with, with some of this, uh, especially the satellite imagery, um, which I think is really exciting and moving beyond just um, sediment, but also looking at things like um, chlorophyll um, and that so we're we're also um, trying to get caught up with that and um, do some satellite work and uh, and I'll combine that with the camera work so basically the satellite work will give you the spatial distribution and then um, the cameras will give you the temporal distribution but not the not obviously not as many locations. So we're, we're excited about some of that work. And then moving on to bed load surrogates. Um, this is something that is moving a little bit slower. There's some processing techniques out there. This is a report um, that John Gray put out in 2010. And a lot of these are still applicable today and just being further worked out. Um, so I put that link in here in the presentation so that um, if you're interested in bed load surrogates, I'll highlight a few things um, from there and then um, have some time for, for questions here. So this is one that's been around the in-situ. So if you have the same bed stream and you have dunes, and this might be a method that would work for you in situ bed load measurements using multi beam echo sounders. And now, um, Aaron Musty, who I've put the contact in here, is also getting us you can combine that with some acoustic Poplar current profile and other information. So, this repeated um, multi beam work uh, with David Abraham, the Corps at US Army Corps of Engineers. There's a paper here, and then Marion Murphy trying to take that to to uh, another level with um, using acoustic popular current profiles. And then, so if you have gravel and things moving, these sediment generated um, noise applications may be um, an option for you. There's some uh, lab and field work by the USDA ARS group and combined with the University of Mississippi. Um, from the instrumentation here, basically you're listening for the the uh, the gravel um, to be knocking against each other. Um, the, uh, and then there's some field deployments of the same technology, the, uh, using hydrophones as a surrogate for monitoring. Um, so this is just taking that technology and moving it to the field again, listening for um, the rocks and gravel and and boulders and things to cobbles to to um, relate that to then physical measurements of the the bed movement. And then just one more example here, the the Elwha River um, bed book place. So this has been tried in a lot of different. Not a lot, but in various areas. This the contact here, Rob Hillbell of the US Bureau of Reclamation. Um, basically, um, same same type of thing, but um, instead here you're listening. You know, you have different um, listening devices that could be put into these plates that could then listen for the the cobbles, gravel, and things um, hitting the, the metal plates. And with that, um, I hand it over to um, see if there's any questions that, that people might have. Thanks, Sim. Uh, now we are going to, to present uh, questions that uh, our audience made in our system. So, 
both you and, and John can answer uh, the, the questions. Uh, first of all, the question came from Rodrigo. Uh, John, it's really nice to see the evolution of sample equipment along the years. About the use of bad load samplers in sand bed rivers, do, do you know if some of them, uh, for example, BLH, A4, are indicated to be used in sand bed environments? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. The, the answer is an emphatically yes, e even though my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Bill Emmett, uh, went into a rage uh, 25 years ago when I told him that, that, that these samplers were being, were being used in sand bed systems. And he said, they're never designed for that. And I said, but everybody's using them like that. So the, uh, the answer is when I did my bed load sampler calibration work in uh, 2006, that, that, that uh, the, the, it's been written up, it hasn't been released and it better be released shortly. Um, I made sure that I calibrated the BL84, the BLH, 84 the and the elwa samplers in uh and and the the original heli smith bed load sampler both in sand bed and gravel bed systems so there will be coefficients coming forward for those and in, in almost all cases the the coefficients will be greater than uh uh unity greater than one Uh, Tim and, and John. Uh, Tobias Bledinger uh, from Federal University, University of Paraná uh, says, John and Tim, great works. Thanks for sharing. We experienced some, quite some uncertainties doing bad load measurements with the Helen Smith sampler. Adding a camera showed quite some flow features in influencing the sediment inputs into the device. Are you aware of any lab studies or alike for that? Um, the question was to me, but uh, I didn't completely understand it, but something tells me, Tim, would you, can you field that question? I don't. Yeah, can you, can you repeat the, the crux of the, the question? Yeah. I think it's about the, Ellie Smith, um, yeah. and I think here, here, here in the view, we have some uh, issues uh, or some uncertainties uh, about the bed load measurements when you use the Helen Smith, uh, principally in sand rivers. Uh, and here we add some uh, a camera on the Helen Smith to 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 record the, the sampling acquisition and using some PIV techniques to, to understand the, the, the movement. And we saw here some flow features influencing the sentiment input on, in this device. So both of you are uh, aware about that and do you have any lab studies about that uh, influence of Halley Smith in bad, bad uh, Bed load sand rivers. Tim. So John, do you you want to talk a little bit about the Kelly Smith oh, and yeah, sand? Yeah. By the way, I'm I'm working on a cold, and I just been I was supposed to go take care of my grandson because because I'm sneezing. They don't want me to come, so I have all the time in the world now. <laughs> the the uh, um. Let's see. Is is the is the question focusing on in the sand bed channel and the heli smith and is it the heli smith which has a, a flare ratio of 3.22 this to this or is it the bl84 that has a flare ratio of this to this the first um, big, big big difference between the two and 
the for the sand for the sand and gravel BL eighty four the the collection coefficient is uh, I, I misspoke a minute ago the, for that particular sample sampler which is approved by the FISP um, the the uh, coefficient of collecting for both gravel and for sand is slightly less than one. It's about 0.85 or 0.87, which is which is pretty close to one. Uh, for the standard Heli Smith 3.22 ratio, the, the, the coefficient of collection was about three. In other words, it collected about three times as much sand coming down the channel as uh, as uh, collected about th three times as much sand as what was actually coming right down the channel at it. And in fact, we have video that shows set, setting in the sand bed uh, channel in the St. Anthony Falls uh, University of Minnesota uh, uh, laboratory flume, video showing sand coming in from a wide swath curling into the sampler. So it was sampling a much wider um, uh, uh, swath of, of, the, of the, the cross section. And secondly, we saw sand moving upstream next to the sampler and, and sucking around in, into, the, uh, uh, into the nozzle, all of which is consistent with the, the presumed um, super uh, uh, suctioning of sand by a factor of three. Now, have, uh, so we, we, we have that and that video is, is available in uh, Groton and Gray um, 2021, I think it is. And, uh, and I can, if, if needed, what I would suggest, Fabio or Diogo, send me an email or Tim, send Tim and me an email and saying, here's the specific information that you're looking for. And, and that that's that's one example. But and I don't there are other examples of that. But did I answer the question? I'm not certain because I'm not certain what the question was. Um, is that adequate? And or Tim, can you add to that? Well, I, I think you you answered the question fairly well. We, we've seen problems with the Healy Smith, the Healy Smith, um, in sand conditions. Essentially, is what you're summarizing. And and it sounds like they have video, maybe of similar things happening um, with the Healy Smith. So we would recommend the BL84 in sand as opposed to the Healy Smith. Cor correct recommendation, as far as I'm concerned in my research. Thank you. Um, another question here is from Rodrigo. Uh, we are seeing non-intrusive equipments to measure suspended sediments over a cross section in a real time. Uh, for example, SL equipments. Do if researchers are developing an equipment that will be able to do bad load estimates with the same characteristics over at least a part of a cross section in real time? What would be the next step to bed load equipment development? And Tim, in the end of your, your presentation, you showed the, the hydrophone uh, equipment and, and others. What do you think about it? Um, I, I think probably, I, you know, I, in my presentation, I gave some of the context of the people that are really intricately involved in that. I would reach out to them. Um, to, I think that, you know they they've had some some uh, good results, but I think it's it, um, quite quite a bit of work to get to those good results, and so I I think there's some cost benefit factors there um, that you, you could talk directly with the researchers that are are working on that. And John, do you have anything to, that you would add to that? No, uh, no, I, I do, I will make a comment, though uh, 
I retired almost nine years ago. I'm a scientist emeritus, but I, I haven't been directly involved in what the FISP has been doing it, uh, for a number of years. I'm greatly impressed, Tim, and I want you to pass that along to, to the, the technical committee that, that I'm really heartened at the, at, the, at the efforts that you guys are doing and using the computational power that, that we that, that's available now that wasn't available when I first started my, the, my, my involvement in this in, in 1977. But, um, so I would, uh, if, if there's other unanswered questions that for me, Tim, again, I would uh, suggest uh, have uh, maybe through um, Fabio uh, or directly just send us some questions and, and what, where I'm able to, to point things fine. But I think Tim is, you're going to find is a much more up to date and relevant uh, contact in that regard. Okay, uh, just just uh, another question to end uh, the doubts about Haley Smith. Uh, Professor Tobias just wants to clarify the question. Uh, how does USGS test the Haley Smith devices? Are you doing lab studies or what type of tests are you doing for validation? And thanks for our Brilton and Gray reference. I definitely will ask for that. Uh, it's just him. Uh, if uh, the USGS made some tests with Halley Smith, or th those tests are already made on the past, and like you said, the the another equipment HV48, it's best to use on SAM. Okay, Tim. I assume I should answer that, or do you, or do you want to answer it? I th I think you can answer that one. Fine, fine. Uh, again, uh, I've been, f for a number of reasons, uh, uh, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, to, to speak some Latin about this is my fault, but uh, I, uh, the calibration work that, that we did with the FISP uh, and other federal agencies in 2006 has been, was written up finally in 2019. There is one, there's one problem with it that I have to address. And as soon as I address that problem, then we're, we're going to uh, complete a uh, journal article uh, probably submitted to the Water Resources Research uh, Journal uh, that, that will give the, the, the whole ball of wax. There are two reports out already, an open file report on the nature of the of the research that we did at the St. Anthony Falls Flume and on the uh, the, the the data availability that are in Groton and Gray 2021. Uh, I would suggest anybody interested in this, hope, give me a few more months. I have to have this done. I have to have this done because I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, and uh, wait for me to get that out, and then and then uh, communicate with me or whatever if you if you think there's any additional work uh, needed or any problems or or whatever. Okay. Okay, John. And then and then if you if you send uh, just a note. Okay, now it's ready. You I can get that and distribute here to our researchers in Brazil, and then all this, this lack of information disappear. <laughs> uh, there's a, another question from Pedro Cunha from National Water Agency here in Brazil for team. Uh, how long time should stay this measuring and ABS you show in this cross section with five verticals and how it's done this correction between volumetric versus mass concentration with the example of SL2. These two questions, if you want to want to repeat each question. Yeah, so with the first one, I think if I repeat it here, uh, so how long were we taking ABS readings to correlate with uh, the suspended sediment concentration? Uh, yeah, it was um, between one and two minutes, um, just to get a variability in, in the readings, I think, uh, 
Um, yeah, so I mean that that's obviously a little subjective, but that seems to give it. You know, it, the system's uh, fairly steady, so that that seems to work out fine. Um, and then the other question, the the SL the the adjustment from volumetric to mass concentration. Um, I, I guess what, what what was the actual question there? The the other question is uh, found again. How it's done this correction between volumetric and mass concentration with the example of SL two. So how how did we how did we do it? Uh, or I'm um, so with that the mass kind of, yeah yeah more just like a regression. So we're you know plotting the the, the volumetric versus mass concentration and then um, doing a regression linear regression on it. If that look if the data looked like it it would be applicable for a linear regression. And in our cases it, it was. Okay. Um, thank you. John and Tim for your time here. Uh, we are very glad to have both of you with us. And now we are finishing uh, our transmission. And we hope see both of you in another uh, event with us, okay? Sounds great, thank you. Bye-bye, John. Hey, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.